your physical heart, it beats 100,000 strokes every 24 hours. It contracts 4,000 times an hour. Our blood weighs about 25 pounds, and all of it passes through the heart every four hours. It contracts 4,000 times an hour. Our blood weighs about 25 pounds, and all of it passes through the heart every four minutes. Now, what does the Bible teach you about the heart? The Bible teaches that our hearts are sinful. Mine is, yours is, we're born with it, from Adam and Eve. It's passed on from generation to generation. And the Bible says, first of all, that our hearts are full of evil imaginations. Proverbs 6, 18, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. And then secondly, the Bible says, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? That's your heart. That's what the Bible thinks of your heart. That's what God thinks about your heart and my heart. The Bible says the heart is far from God in Matthew 15. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And the Bible says that he gives a new heart. God says an old heart will not do. You have to have a new one. And God doesn't just patch you up. A new heart also I will give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. God says, a new heart is what you need. If your heart's right, the rest of you is going to be right too. What about you? Is your heart right? Hey, uh, I want to say uh, thank you for being here this morning. And uh, we, we've been in a series called uh, Change of Heart, uh, Learning to Love What God's Love. And what an incredible journey uh, that is. Uh, from the moment that you and I, that uh, we give our lives to Christ or we give our heart to Him, it's learning to detach our heart to the things that we shouldn't love and attach them to the things that God loves. Uh, even yesterday, it was so encouraging to see so many of you men here for the, the men's breakfast and just to talk about as work is worship and that, uh, that God's placed you in that work for the people around you and just to see the camaraderie and love. Because, listen, hey, I need to love my coworkers. I need to love them as Christ has loved me. And, and then right after that, our, our kids on Masters Road team and moms and dads who brought their kids up here for the Red Plus Cello Show, that once a month we have a, a family worship center so, uh, service so moms and dads can, can worship with their kids. And why? Because those are the things that God loves. He, he loves your coworkers. He loves to see your work as worship. And Jesus said, hey, let the kids come to me. He said this, he said, hey, kids, I'm not going to tell you to have an adult-like faith. I've seen where that goes. It gets crusty and stale real quick. He said, no, 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 adults, you need to have what? A childlike faith. And it's so great to see kids on Master's Road and these kids that have great faith toward God. What's happening in those scenarios? It's, it's men, it's moms and dads, and it's kids going, what? man, I want to love what God loves. All right, get your hearts out. Here we go. Let's see, let's see what you love today. All right, how many of you say, you know what? I like the old style houses, right? Like I like the old stuff. I like the Victorian, the Tudor house. Or are you somebody like, hey, give me the modern and the sleek. So how many say, I love an old style house? Okay. How many of you like a modern style house? Okay, not really close on that one. Old style? Okay, none of y'all live in one. Because if you live in one, you're tired of those repairs. <laughs> modern ones? I know. Everybody wants an Apple store for their house. I don't get it. Clean lines and stale. Okay. How many of you go, you know what? I like the old school, Sunday school adult classrooms. Put your heart up. Man, that's my, my, my jam. I like the old school adults in Bible study. Old school, Sunday school. Ashley, you don't have a heart? Don't, don't you like, you know. Okay, how many of you like the new school and home groups? Did you? Okay, some of you don't love neither. Now, come on, you got to pick one. How many old school, Sunday school? Raise it up. How many new school, home groups? Okay. Now, I would argue the new school home groups is really older school, right? Because that's how it started. Acts chapter 2, they met in 
poems around the Bible. So that's really older school than cramming a bunch of adults, giving them a donut and say, hey, be genuine. You got 30 minutes. Uh, Hey, both are good, though. Both are good. Listen, if you're, if you're studying God's Word, you're in good shape. We just knew here at this church we would never have enough rooms uh, to have adult Bible study. So we say, hey, let's fill it up with kids, serve kids, and then we'll do Bible study and homes during the week. If you don't have a home group, find one. How about this? How many of you like old people and how many of you like new people? Okay? How many of you are old people? You like hanging around with old people? Put it up. How many of you like hanging out with new people, the babies? Oh, we got some baby whispers. Let's try this close. Old people? New people. Man, that is really, I, I think old people barely got that one. Uh, I'm in the old people category. I love hanging out with old people. I, I talked to a lady for 35 minutes before her funeral this week. She's 86 years old, and it was my favorite conversation all week long. I love hearing the stories. I love hearing the passion. I mean, she remembers her grandmother being in, in cart and buggy, right? And she remembers this area, like, none of, and all the change they've gone through, but yet there's still something in them that has some fight in them. I like old people. All right. How about this? How many of you like the old fuel and uh, the new fuel? So this is a Hummer. They stopped making those in about 2009 because gas prices, gas guzzler. How many of you go, I'm a gas person? How many of you are the electric person? Of course. We're in Houston, Texas. <laughs> hey, we love you, brother. It's okay. Hey, that Hummer, that, that's like $180,000 I hear for that ele- all-electric uh, Hummer. I'm not even going to ask for a revote because that one was clear. Uh, I wouldn't mind a Tesla Cybertruck. Hey, if I get one, if we get, hey, Tesla Cybertruck, me and you, we're going for a drive. Uh, speaking of cars, how many of you like the old Corvette versus the new Corvette? So you got the, the older Corvette. Here's a 50, I think a 58 or 59. How many go, give me the old classic Corvette? How many of you like the new style Corvette, European, modern, kind of like a McLaren? Old Corvette, once again, old Corvette, new Corvette, old has got it. There's something about just... Going back to the old thing, isn't there, that we all kind of gravitate toward, we all kind of like. The thing, speaking of cars, the thing about cars is um, when they get old enough, they can become a classic and you like them again, um, or if they're new, it's that kind of in between. I mean, for instance, how many of you love this 1998 Chevy Monte Carlo? What are you doing? How, how, many, of you, how many of you love... Right, that, there's maybe a heart or two out, but you really don't love a 1998 Chevy Monte Carlo. But this guy does. My name is Nathaniel, I'm 27 years old. And I'm in a serious relationship with my car. Morning, baby. My handsome man. Nathaniel is in a committed relationship with a car that he's named Chase. He met Chase in a resale lot about five years ago. Love you, baby. It was love at first sight. His body and then his interior and everything just together just seemed to fit. And I just felt an instant connection. Nathaniel's obsession first developed as a teenager when he would build model cars. But he didn't find true love until he met Chase. I just absolutely love Chase. We always have such a good time together. He likes a lot of the same music I do. We have a favorite song. It's uh, Can't Fight This Feeling by Ariel Speedwagon. The favorite date would be going to the lookout area. Just lean against him a little and just be with him mainly. Love you. There have been times it brought tears to my eyes because I wasn't with him at work. His picture's on my desktop, so I see his face all the time. It really bothers me when he gets dinged or scratched. If somewhere would have him chase, I, I, my heart would just stop. I just have to gather myself here. I'm sorry for all this. I don't even know what to do with that video. I mean, falling in love with a car, naming him Chase is a boy's name. I, I'm like, I'm waiting for like the Energizer Bunny to come out. Is this an SNL skit? No, it's true. I'm just telling you, if you are a teenager doing model cars, our eye is on you. Okay, we are looking out. Because that does not lead to a good place of you falling in love with the car. Listen, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
And some of you would say, hey, I, I, I would never fall in love with a car. But you know you've fallen in love with things that were wrong. And all of us know what? We need a change of heart. That our heart wants to latch on to the wrong things all the time. So we've been in Ephesians uh, chapter 4 and uh, looking at this passage. And uh, I want to read verses 18 to 19. That's where we've been. And then uh, we'll jump in the word together again in verse 20. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And we talked about uh, really phrase by phrase, word by word over the last uh, three weeks up to this point. Now we're in uh, verse 20, if you want to turn there, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, and we're going to learn about this idea of being in Christ and this old man versus the new man. Look at verse 20. But this is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. What are you saying? All those things we just read, he said, that's not Christ. You won't find Christ in those things. You weren't taught that. That wasn't learned. That came from your own self, your own deceitful desires. And he said this, that you have to understand the truth is what? Is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. You're not going to find truth anywhere else. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and it's going to be found in Jesus. Um, and this is all talking about what? Our um, um, identity. Someone uh, was, was, I, was we were, I listened to like a podcast yesterday for like two and a half hours. And uh, it was all on the subject about, you know, our culture is no longer really postmodern. It's really pre-Christian. Like our culture is so pagan. It's like God never came through Jesus. The church was never launched. God never gave us the word. It's like people don't even know it existed. They don't know their salvation and there's truth in Jesus. It's like it never even happened. And people in our leadership go throughout this world never even acknowledging God or Christ or salvation. That we're pre-Christian, that Christ is going to come again and reign for a thousand years. Oh, that's what all this is about. That we live in this time and era where people have forgotten that it's in Jesus that we really find the truth. And it starts with this idea of in Jesus because it's about our identity. Of course, many of you are familiar with 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, what if anyone is in Jesus? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is talking about when you and I, what? When we have repentance and we receive salvation. He says what? Now, therefore, what? There you are a new creation. The old is gone, but the new has come. What is he talking about in this moment? I mean, what? What? What actually changes in that moment? Does your appearance, do you physically change appearance-wise? No. I mean, I would argue, though, a life in Christ physically will be a lot better than a life outside of Christ. We went to the radio thir- or rodeo Thursday night, and me and Joel were like, you can look at some people and go, man, they're, in, they're entangled with some sin. You can see it on their face, the way they dress, clothes, talk, it's like, man... They are, they are entangled in some sin they can't get out of. And physically, you can see it on them. And then others that are Christians, man, they can go with all kind of stuff. And there's a glow about them, a peace about them, a chill about them. Like physically, their complexion, they're not stressed out, they're not worried. They're not all wrinkled up, bitter and sour. You know what I'm talking about? I do think physically, over time, there'll be a change appearance-wise, but not right away. What about your habits? Do your habits instantly change when you receive Christ? Some people think that. In fact, some people think they got to get their habits right before they can come to Christ. And then that continues. It's all about their performance and stop doing this and do this and don't do that and do this. But we know, listen, habits take a long time to break. Ask someone who, who, who quit smoking or, or quit uh, prescription drugs. When you form that habit, it takes a lot of energy, effort, and power to break that habit, even when you want to. And you know what? It takes some time to develop godly habits. Your habits don't change right away. What about your decision making? Does that change right away? Does your thinking change? 
over time it will, it sure will. You'll think differently about everything. But in that moment, not necessarily. There's not an instant change. What is this thing? What is this um, uh, 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 new thing? You know what happens? You get a new heart. And you have the capacity to both be loved by God and to love other people. That's what's happening when you become a new creation. It happens on the inside. It happens in your heart. Do you remember, parents, when, when you had one child and you're about to have your second child and you're like, can we love them the same way? I don't think I can. Because you love that first kid so much and you're like, man, what am I going to do? They're going to know that they're my favorite, right? And what happens? God gives you what? A capacity, a more capacity to love that child just as much. And it's the same thing. When you become a new creation, you have a heart that's been regenerated to be created to love God and know God, but also what? To love others. That is the new creation. And it's all about our identity in Christ. Listen. You and I can have no dent in our identity. What do I mean by that? You can... You either in Christ or you're not in Christ. You either have that heart or you don't have that heart. And your identity will be under attack. And you better know whose you are. Um, Jesus himself, do you remember at his baptism? By the way, if, if you want any clarity on the Trinity, all three are present at this moment in Scripture. We have Jesus being baptized. We have the Holy Spirit there present through the dove. And God speaks audibly. The crowd heard what God said from heaven. And at Jesus' baptism, this is what God the Father spoke up so the whole place could hear. And behold, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What is happening? God the Father is saying, that's my son. His identity is with me and I am well pleased with him. That God the Father said, no, that every son needs to know he's a son. And that we are, we are together. I am with him. I am pleased with him. Because he's about to go do ministry, and I don't want to doubt whose he is. And then I'm pleased with him. What happens? Jesus goes straight from there. He goes into the wilderness for preparation. The enemy comes to tempt him. What's the very first temptation? What's the first thing out of the enemy's mouth? If you are what? The son of God. You're just a man, what, if, if you're what, who God says you are. He's questioned Jesus' identity. If you are a son, if you are the son of God. And if you think, this is how important this is, that the enemy's coming after Jesus on his own identity. If you are who God says you are. And man, can, these last several years, what's been under attack? People's identity. Listen, it's time for people to go, man, I, I identify with Christ. I'm in Christ. I'm a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And our identity is where we get approval and source of power and comfort and security. And, and we'll get into that at, at some point. But all of us need to understand our identity. And the enemy always wants to attack whose we are and who we are. Verse 22, let's keep reading, says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Wow, there's so much theology in here. Um, in this statement. He says, listen, uh, you're in Christ, and here's the goal. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, which is corrupt. That all of us have a what? We have a story before Christ. When we met Christ and life after Christ. And he's going, listen, you got to put off that, that, that old manner, that old self. The word is like clothes. Take off the old clothes. Take off the, the mannerisms, the things that you used to be in your former life. Because what? Those things will what? They will corrupt you. Not only will, were you corrupted through them, what? It deceived you. Do you remember that? Do you remember when life was about this or about that? You were what? You were being deceived by the world. Your heart was being deceived that, oh, I get power or I get security or I get approval through these other things. And you're deceiving yourself. You're being deceived by the world. He goes, listen, you got to throw off that old manner of life 
that's corrupted, and it was deceived by what? By your decisions? No. By your actions? No. It says deceived by what? Your desires. Where does that come from? The heart. It was the desires of your heart that was the problem. Uh, you ever, uh, this is our first year of, of student camp, sixth grade. By the way, today's the first day to sign up for student camp. If you have a student, put your deposit down, sign them up. It'll change their life. Sixth grade, first year of camp. And my mom, you know, got me a couple new shirts and shorts from Wieners. Y'all remember Wieners? They had the best layaway, okay? All excited about getting clothes from Wieners. But I, I was, and when it came to socks and underwear, I'm like, hey, I got it. Like, right? Like, hey, mom, I'm in sixth grade now. Don't worry about my underwear and socks. I got it, okay? And guess what I packed for a whole week at camp? One pair of socks, one pair of underwear. <laughs> that I had on, you know what I mean? Now, you know how this happens. What happens? Well, you, you're sweating, you're working all the camp, and you go, you take a shower. Well, second day. You know, I was in sixth grade. Maybe it was the third day. But I took a shower at some point. And what are you faced with? Your body's clean, but what? I got to put on those underwear and those socks. You ever been there? And those socks are funky, and every day they get worse and worse, and you got to slide them on your feet, and you're clean, but you're wearing dirty socks. You know the feeling? Now, to this day, I'm a grown man. Every time I go, I buy new underwear and new socks. Truth? Truth. We're going to Montana. Mr. I buy new socks every trip I go. Because I don't like that feeling. And he says, listen, that stuff is gone. It's like old clothes. You got to put them on. Verse 23. And to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Romans 12, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. You want to mend that heart? You want to, listen, you got to mind it. What comes in the mind will come out in life. What is your thinking? Who are you? You have the mind of Christ that, listen, it's going to start right. Why? Because the way that you believe will determine what? How you behave. And you've got to change the way you think about God. You've got to change the way that God thinks about you and how God thinks about uh, other people. And he says, listen, you will be renewed and transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why so many, man, you put yourself up to this and go, God, man, I want to know you. I want to see it. I want to understand it because i got a lot of bad thinking up here. And i gotta, I got to get my mind right. i got to be renewed by my mind. And look at verse 24. And he says, and what? And to put on, here it is, the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. He says, put off the old man and what? And put on the new self. Same word, close. Throw on a new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. What? That you're created in the image of God, dressed like him. And you'll be led. It's not deception. It's true here. No deception. True what? Righteousness. Right living. And what? Holiness. A life separated for the plans and purposes of God. And he goes on. Putting those fresh socks on. It's like fast food. I love putting on a brand new pair of socks when your feet are clean after a long, tired day. Go to bed in. Now this idea of putting on this new self and these new clothes. Um, we have a great text in Colossians 3, 12 through 17 that speaks about this. I want, you to, I want you to see if you can see the theme. I'll try to point it out. Here we are in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with what? Hearts. Clothe yourself with what? Hearts of compassion. Hearts of kindness. Hearts of humility. Hearts of gentleness. Hearts of patience. Bear with one another and forgive any complaint you may have against someone else. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtue, put on love. Where does love come? From the heart. Let the peace of Christ rule where? In your hearts. For to this you were called as members of one body to be thankful God the Father through him. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you in your heart as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and 
spiritual songs with gratitude in your what? In your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to him and God the Father through him. So we, we, these things, we put on these things. And when he says, put it, he's talking about this is what your heart wears, this is what you put on. And do you remember uh, Deion Sanders? Um, he was the first athlete, it was in the early 90s, that he started dressing up before the game and after the game. So before the game, he'd walk up to the stadium, he would just have a, a nice suit on. And then after the game, everybody would shower, throw like, you know, clothes on, like just workout clothes, and he'd be dressed up again. Now everybody does it. But he was the first athlete. They said, Dion, what? Why do you dress up to come put your workout clothes on and to play football or baseball? And he said this. He said, you know what? When I dress up, I feel good. And when I feel good, I play good. And when I play good, they pay good. <laughs> and listen, I, I, I'm praying for Dion. Um, uh, he's now the head coach at Colorado. And, uh, and God's doing something new on that campus right there. Dion's a godly man. He's been through a lot, but he's a godly man. I, I love the access that we have now. And he was talking to his players and coaches and the staff. And like, what do you do? What do you do? And one's like, oh, I'm, I'm the, the, the mental uh, health coach. And he's like, great, glad you're here. He goes, where are the pastors? Because these kids need spiritual help. Where are the pastors? We need pastors on staff. We need pastors here. Because people need to know who they are. All of that sounds good, doesn't it? Right? Yeah, of course. Man, I'm, I'm putting off the old life and putting off those clothes and I'm putting on these things. But what's the truth that you and I both know? The old man doesn't leave you alone, does he? Uh, for me, uh, most of my life has been after Christ. I received Christ as, when I was younger. And uh, I have struggled way more with my sin after salvation than before. And I know that the old man and those things that my heart needs to have, they want to keep coming back. This is the fight for you and I. It's the fight. Are we going to put back the old clothes on? Or are we going to continue to put on the clothes of our heart that I just read about? And, here, and here's what I, I know. It, it comes down to my heart and your heart. And here's what I know. Sometimes love will lead. And I'm saying this as vulnerably as I can. I want you to know, when you receive Christ, I wish it was just a straight line always going up and becoming more like Christ. But you know what I've seen in my own life? And I've seen, man, sometimes, man, you are loving God. And listen, you're, you're living life. You're living your life for God. And it's great. And then sometimes what? Man, your heart becomes to get cynical. Your heart becomes to get distant. And you just really, you, you, you don't love him as much as you used to love him. And you can go to really a dark, distant place. And all of a sudden, God will turn that heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And he'll begin to bring you back. But it's not a straight line, is it? It's up and it's down and it's up and it's down. And the key is, it's our heart. It's our love for God. And it's our love for Him is the real issue. If we're going to put on old clothes or we're going to keep putting on the new stuff. Because when we love Him, when our heart is in love, when our heart is in it. Jesus um, gave us a beautiful example of this. Um, the disciple that is always named first in all four Gospels, and he was by far the leader of the disciples, of course, was Peter. And um, we see a beautiful, there's more conversation between Jesus and Peter than any other disciple relationship. And probably because the disciple, Peter was the leader and God gives us a lot about leadership and, and all that sorts of things. And uh, we see, you know, Peter at his highest and Peter at his lows and all of that. And when it comes to this idea of the old man coming back in, we see this happen in, in Peter's life. Do you remember... Um, Peter's original name, of course, was Simon. And Jesus tells Simon, your name is now going to be Peter or Petros, the rock. Right? And upon that confession, upon that rock, I'm going to build my church. But after that, 
there are still times, what, that Jesus calls Peter what? He calls him Simon. Why does he call him Simon? Because Peter's acting like the old man. And he's going, Simon, get behind me. Simon, Simon, you couldn't stay awake one hour? Here I am in the garden. I'm sweating blood. I asked you to pray and you fell asleep. Simon, you fell asleep. You couldn't stay up for one hour. It's kind of like when your parents use your middle name. Jason Stewart. And Peter's like, please call me Peter, not Simon, because I know I'm in trouble if you call me Simon. But what is Jesus demonstrating here? He's saying, what? The old man's going to try to come back, and I'm going to call it out of you, Peter. That's not who you are. That's not your identity. Your identity is the rock. Stop acting like Simon. When's the last time Jesus called Peter Simon? It was after Jesus' death on the cross. Christ hasn't resurrected yet. Remember what Peter said? I'm going to miss you. He got impatient. He said, return to Galilee. And here we are. And where's Jesus? I'm going fishing. And because he was a leader, what? It says all the other disciples went with him. Dad, do you understand that? We were talking about this Saturday morning. Dad, hey, you better know where you stay on heaven and hell. Because when you get there, you're going to look back. And your kids are going to be there with you. Where are you taking them? Every kid has a propensity, desire to be with the Father. And the leader in this case was, was Peter. And all the, and all the other uh, stuff went fishing with him. And Jesus comes back. They fish all night. Don't catch anything. And there's Jesus prepared this meal for him and some food. And this is the restoration of Peter's life. And this is what, when they had finished eating, Jesus asked Simon. Actually, Simon, this is John Wright. He asked Simon Peter. Uh, John just always added both names because he probably saw him as Simon and Peter a lot. Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah. John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he answered. You know I love you. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he answered. You know I love you. Jesus told him to shepherd my sheep. For a third time, Jesus, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was deeply hurt that Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things, he replied. You know I love you. What was the issue? What is Jesus? Peter, it's about your heart. Do you love me? And when you're in love me, you don't have to worry about being Simon. You're going to be Peter. Just keep your affection toward me. Keep loving me. Keep letting me lead you. And if you'll do that, everything else will fall in place. You learn to love me and be loved by me, and you won't have to worry about loving others. And that was the last time that Peter was ever called Simon. But look how that passed. I love verse 18 in this. Truly, truly, I tell you, when you were young, this is Jesus speaking to Peter. Truly, truly, I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourselves and walked where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And after he had said this, he told him the very thing he told him the first time. He said, what? Follow me. He said, listen, Peter, they're going to kill you. They persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If you side with me and you side with God, the world will hate you and they're going to, I want you to know, death because of me is coming your way. I don't want you to be surprised by it. I want you to know right now, uh, this, is, this is your destiny and I want you to walk in it. So, you want to follow me? And Peter wholeheartedly followed him that day. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost the gospel stood up in front of government and persecution and preached the gospel and you better believe it it cost him his life and you may remember that when it was time for Peter to be crucified he said listen I, I can't be crucified like my Lord turn me upside down I'm not worthy to be crucified like him love is always the lead again isn't it it's the love of God that will bring you and I back. 
And when we are loved by God and we know that we love him and we follow him, we don't care what happens to us. The truth for you and I is what love is left? This is really the condition, isn't it? This is really the, the measurable, if you will. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says, And if I, have, if I have prophetic power to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. That challenges me. That convicts me. And when it's all said and done, Jason, did you love me? Did you love your wife? Did you love your kids? Did you love your church? Did you love your community? That's all I care about. You know, we're always talking about faith. I love talking about faith. I love being around faithful people who don't, they see a mountain. They go, man, God can move it. I love that. But this passage says, even if we're moving mountains by faith, it can still be for nothing. If we don't love them. If we don't do it with love. I don't know what kind of church we'll become. But I know this. Jesus said you'll know they're my disciples by how they love. And I pray that we'd be a church what? That's a loving church. That loves God. Loves God's people. Loves the community, loves the brokenhearted, loves the poor and needy. You know, it's like uh, we get hard in it, you know? Isn't that what my life's about? What are you passionate about? Is your heart in it? Do you care? Do you love? And that's, and that's the test for me. That's the test for you. Can we serve cheerfully and lovingly? Can we give and steward loving and cheerfully? Is, there, is it just kind of drip? There's an aroma like, man, somebody really loves in here. And I, and I, and I say these things knowing I've got them wrong more than I've got them right. This morning I... I realized that today's date, um, this day 20 years ago, March 5th, 2003, I was given this uh, sheepskin Bible from my pastor, Dr. Graham, and he wrote a little inscription to me, and ten men affirmed God's ministry in my life, and they prayed over me, and it was the day I was ordained. It was a very special day. And I, I wish I could tell you these last 20 years that, you know, my heart's just always been on fire for God and my wife and my kids. But there are times that my heart grows cold to certain things or it gets cynical or it forgets who God is and forgets who I am. And I want to love better and I want to love more than I've loved the last 20 years. I want the next 20 years of my life to be just, I want to love well. And I want to say thank you for your love for the Lord and your love for this church and your love for me and my family and each other. It's what matters. And I know there's a lot of question marks and there's, there's difficulty and there's, there's stress. There's all those things. But I know the test for you and I is are we trying to love more? Is there more love in here? Is there more capacity in our heart to love? So that's my prayer for us this morning, my prayer for my life. That even if we have the prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and 
If I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. The verse that Dr. Graham wrote was Jeremiah 33, 3. Jeremiah is a special book to me, and it's one of the reasons it's the middle name of my son. But it says, call to me, and I'll answer you. And I'll show you great and mighty things, which you don't know. The truth is, I don't know how much God loves me today. I don't know. I can't fathom. I think I have an idea. But honestly, I don't know how much he loves me. But he says, will you call to me? If you're hard, if you mean it, if you really want to know me, if you really want to understand, call to me. And I will answer you. And I will share with you great and mighty things that you'll never know. I'll tell you something. Can I ask for your forgiveness, Lord, where I haven't loved well and God, I thank you for your forgiveness. God, I thank you that you wait by the, the sea when all of us go fishing. That you want to restore all of our hearts. You want us to return to our first love. Sometimes in the church, that's the problem. We don't, we lose our first love. And God, I thank you for as you had a heart-to-heart -heart with Peter, and it's a simple question, Peter, do you love me? And I pray that our lives in this church and this ministry would be marked by love. That I pray we'd be quick to throw a robe and a ring and a party for the prodigal son or daughter. And I pray you'd soften our heart. You'd make it tender. And God, we would steward everything with such joy and patience and cheerfully that we get a day to manage and we get a life to live. And you want people to know how much you love them by how well we love each other. God, I thank you for the new heart that you gave all of us, that we have a capacity to receive love from you and a capacity to love others. You gave us a new heart. Thank you for that. God, I just pray for the areas where it's become stony or hard. God, I pray we'd know how much you love us this morning. And would you help us love others the way that you love them? God, I thank you for just this day, and I thank you for the reminder of what you want to do in my heart. I'm grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we'll uh, sing this chorus again. I know you're hurting. I can see it in your eyes. So pull back the curtain. Take off your disguise. Ooh, well.